Hey everyone, this is UCLA's Housing Voice Podcast, back for episode two. I'm Shane Phillips, and I run the housing initiative for the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies, and this podcast is all about making important housing research accessible to more people and trying to make sense of it in conversation with the researchers themselves. My co-host, as always, is Dr. Mike Lenz. Mike, can you list off some of your many, many titles for us? Uh, Hi, Shane. I am Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy and the Associate Faculty Director at the Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies. That's right. Let's get started. Today, Mike and I are joined by a new member of the UCLA faculty, Professor Jose Loya. Dr. Loya comes to us by way of the University of Pennsylvania, where he got his PhD, and he also worked on community development and affordable housing in South Florida for several years. Thanks for joining us, Jose, and welcome to UCLA. Thanks, Shane and Mike. I'm really excited to be here. And since you're new to the school, and even we don't know a whole lot about you yet, can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, your research interests? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I actually was born and raised in Los Angeles, so I'm not actually completely new. Oh, great. But I was, but I did leave for college and, and never, and kind of never came back. So I'm, I'm new to the city as an adult, as I'd like to say. Mm-hmm. But I was born and raised actually in Northeast LA uh, in a small neighborhood called Glass Island Cypress Park, and then went off to college at to Brown and have just really been interested in housing probably since like the end of my, I guess my end of my undergraduate experience at Brown. And so that kind of like the mentorship and just experience in the classroom really just allowed me to get hands on with some of the housing issues that were affecting uh, minorities in, in Providence, Rhode Island at the time. Mm-hmm. Did you have any sense when you still lived in LA before moving away of like the changes that were happening? You know, I live in Lincoln Heights now and I see that I'm part of the changes happening here. And so, you know, you were just a few miles north. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I was always in Lincoln Heights, so I, I still go to <laughs> the, the, the Elote Man and the Paletero there. <laughs> still and, here. And so, yeah, I think growing up, it was a predominantly Latino community, a uh, very working class focus. I don't think the changes really started to occur until I probably was in my early 20s. And so growing up, I didn't really see those changes because the neighborhood is still predominantly single family home or single family home ownership. So the the, the turnover just wasn't very quickly. But now as an adult and just having returned, you definitely see a new presence, a a new change in the culture, a new um, just change in in how people, I, I, I always joke with my mom, like, there's bikers now. <laughs> we didn't have bikes, but there's a bike lane. Uh, those types of things that we just didn't have uh, when I was growing up. And so it's kind of cool to see some of these changes while on the other side, also taking into account that there's also been some displacement of some right. of the previous uh, residents in the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, welcome back. And uh, the paper we're talking about today is titled The Great Recession and Ethno-Racial Disparities in Access to Mortgage Credit. And your co-author on this is Dr. Chinoa Flippin. Uh, I think I messed up that name, even though I asked you immediately beforehand how to pronounce it. So my apologies. So you worked with as a doctoral student at Penn. Um, in this paper, you looked at mortgage outcomes for different ethnic and racial groups before, during, and after the Great Recessions, uh, Recession. And those outcomes were either approval under a few different conditions or denial for a few possible reasons. And before we get into those details um, and the results of your study, can you first give us some context for why this is of interest? I, I know we could probably take this all the way back to you know, redlining, racial covenants, or even further than that, but maybe we can just start with some stats on homeownership rates for different groups uh, and some history on how different ethnic and racial groups were treated in the mortgage market leading up to the Great Recession? Yeah. When we think about housing, I like to think of it as like the simple fact is that home ownership is the largest vehicle for creating wealth in the U.S. And so it's an important part and pillar of how of financial security for most families in the U.S. So whether we're trying to achieve home ownership or those that are already in home ownership, this is like a huge a key to some of the inequality and wealth accumulation that we see in the U.S. And so this paper 
in particular kind of examines the access to mortgage credit before, during, and after the Great Recession. Uh, in many ways, I'm almost kind of looking, or this paper, or we both, Cheno and I, want to take, we know that market conditions aren't static over time. And so we wanted to explore whether or not inequality also isn't static over time. Mm-hmm. And so if we look at home ownership rates, for example, they've actually kind of remained steady since like the early or since like the mid 2000s, right? So when we look at whites, home ownership rate is about 70 to 75%. When we look at black and Latino um, home ownership rates, they hover around 20%. So there's a 20% gap. Oh, and when we look at Asians, it's about 61%. So they're like in the middle. And we see that they kind of have been stable over time. And a lot of times we think of it as like, well, does that mean inequality has just remained the same over time? You know, different conditions in the in the housing market kind of lead us to think that just because we look at home ownership rates. But this paper is actually saying like, let's look beyond just the rates of home ownership and examine how we access mortgage credit. How has that changed over time? What can that tell us about home ownership overall? And so it's kind of cool. There's some new papers coming out that just kind of show that home ownership rate, the, the difference in home ownership rates, that 20 point gap has been there for almost 25, 30 years. Wow. And so that has huge implications when we think about social stratification and ethno-racial inequality in the U.S. Uh, more broadly. Right. So, there's not, there's not, that catch up isn't happening. That exactly. We hope to exactly. see. Mike, yeah. you? Oh, yeah. Just a point of clarification. I think you said that the the Black and Hispanic uh, homeownership rate was around 20%, but the first time, but it's the gap is about 20%, Correct. 20, 25%, depending on the year or whatever. While I'm here, you know, specifically what, what came of your interests about as far as coming out of the great recession, right? Because like so much has been studied leading up to the great recession and what some of the impacts on what some of the borrower outcomes were, what some of the foreclosure outcomes were, losses in wealth, et cetera. What was your interest in looking at uh, at these gaps in terms of loan outcomes coming out of the Great Recession? Well, the first is we know very limited information on what's happening after. So we kind of, at least when we examine the literature, we see that there's, like you said, huge emphasis during the housing bubble, predominantly in like the arena of like subprime mortgages in terms of access to credit. During the crisis, we see that simply there's no access to credit for anyone. And so because of that, we see that the stall, the housing market really just stalls out and declines significantly. And to a certain extent, we see that the recovery period, and, and, and one could argue that we're still recovering, that it's been pretty solid. Yet we don't know how minorities in particular are participating in mortgage credit or in home ownership access. So I think there's a limited understanding. And the third thing, and, and really important is, what kinds of loans are people getting now, right? So we have this huge understanding that people in the in the bubble and during mostly in the bubble were getting high cost loans or disproportionately getting high cost loans if you're a minority. Well, now that we've regulated through Dodd Dodd Frank uh, and lenders are are much more cautious, quote unquote, when it comes to high cost loans. What does that look like now for minorities that once utilized them at a disproportionate level? What does that look like now as the market is increasing and recovering? And in a lot of ways, creating wealth for homeowners again. So mm-hmm. that was the, that third interest, which is what kinds of loans are people actually taking up? And to a certain extent, are we going to do what we've been doing? In other words, do we have another bubble coming? Right. I, I, I do feel like that's part of what this is getting at is, is have we learned any lessons? Did we make any changes so that we're not going to repeat the same mistakes? Yeah. And uh, so I think we're going to answer that in, in a few moments. For this study, you're, as, as we said, you're expanding on what we know from before and during the Great Recession and comparing that to the post-recession period up through 2017 for this paper. And to set the stage here, you have mortgage applicants who can be approved with either a conventional loan, so kind of normal standard interest rates or a high cost loan, which is, you know, a couple uh, points above. So like if, if a standard loan is 4%, they might be getting like a 6% interest mortgage or something like that. And those high cost loans are sort of, I, I, I don't think they're exactly the same thing, but they're sort of analogous to the subprime loans that we're kind of more familiar with. And then 
Alternatively, if they're rejected, they could be rejected due to bad credit, or they could be rejected for a, quote, other reason, unquote. So you looked at these data for Black, White, Asian, and Latino applicants for every year from 2004 to 2017. What, what did you find? So we found three interesting things. The first one, uh, which I guess I was alluding to in the beginning, was that, in fact, ethno-racial inequality is heavily tied to market conditions. And what I mean by that is when times are good, we see large inequality or large ethno-racial inequality in the mortgage market. When times were bad, like the Great Recession, we see these, this inequality shrink dramatically, especially for Asians uh, to, to whites. And, and then, but however, it's, it does shrink dramatically for Latinos and Blacks as well. So it's, I mean, are you saying basically like when times are bad, they're bad for everyone, but when times are good, they're better for white people and Asian people and, and not so much better for Black and Latino people, essentially? To a certain extent, yeah. I'm saying yeah. I, almost to, I mean, if we have an example, I, I, ha, I have the ability, to discrim, I, the ability to discriminate more because I have so many more options to lend, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to, to different buyers. So I can, I can choose, pick and choose who I want to, to, to lend to. And then during the recovery period, which was really interesting to me, was that we start to see inequality begin to expand. And so we see it up through 2017. And in the paper, we document these, th these, these differences across ethno-racial groups. And so that was the first one. The second one was that the borrowers looking to, the types of borrowers in the mortgage market also changed dramatically. So we see that more specifically, a huge drop-off in Latino and Black borrowers, in the number of Latino and Black borrowers during the Great Recession. And so we see that across the board for everyone. However, it's especially more dramatic for Latinos and Blacks. But during the recovery period, Latino and Black borrowers just don't come back. So we mm -hmm. see a, a sharp rise in the number of, of number of white and Asian borrowers, but we don't see that dramatic increase for Black and Latino borrowers. And so that's the second one, which is we see really a demographic change in the types of borrowers in, in the mortgage market. And then the third one, which is the thing I think a lot of people like to talk about, is that the odds ratios or the disparities during the recovery period begin to reflect the disparities that we see during the housing bubble, which is especially alarming when we think about the types of regulations or the tightening of regulations in the mortgage market through Dodd-Frank. And so even with that kind of legislation, we still we, we begin to see this this uh, increase in high cost lending or the odds of getting a high cost loan, again, for mm -hmm. black and brown borrowers, which is something that we don't typically talk about or expect in the current, in the current economic situation. And so I, I want to make sure I'm fully understanding. You talked about during the recovery, more white and Asian borrowers kind of came into the market and they started kind of fill in the drop that occurred during the Great Recession and shortly afterward, but Black and Latino borrowers did not really come back. And yet, over time, the share of Black and Latino borrowers who have been getting either rejected or getting approved for high-cost loans has been growing. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And so, so it's not like, you know, more people are flooding into this market and lenders are saying, well, you know, you were a marginal person who just now is coming in and, and we're going to reject you. This is you know, we can't be sure, but it's the same number, if not exactly the same people. Well, the odds. Yeah. So, so yeah. it would be, uh, I mean, if we look at just mortgage access in general, we'd see a huge drop off in high cost loans. And in fact, when when the Humda data set, which is what where this data comes from, when HUD reports the Humda data set, they show that subprime lending or high cost lending, I should say, is remains really low. And that's true. But that's because disproportionate number of borrowers are actually white compared mm. to what we had in the past when we had great when black and Latino borrowers had greater access to this credit. However, the odds of getting a high cost loan if you're black or brown during the recovery period is still the same as what we saw during the bubble. And so mm -hmm. that is particularly like problematic when we think about this shift in the demographics. So we also see not just talking about like a, an ethno-racial shift in the demographics, but we also see that incomes have risen, right? So we have, technically, we can, we can argue that we have more qualified buyers in the market 
yet they're still just as likely to get these problematic loans when we control right. our models. Um, and that that's pretty alarming, um, to say the least. And Jose, um, did you say that coming out of the Great Recession, that gap uh, between white borrowers and Hispanic and black borrowers has gotten larger in terms of uh, the the likelihood of which that they're going to receive high cost loans or be rejected? No. So actually that difference during the Great Recession fell dramatically. And so during the housing boom, if, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, we're talking like black and Latino borrowers were, were, two, were more than two, 200% more likely to get a high cost loan. That, fall, that fell to like less than 50% during the Great Recession. But then we begin to see that. Dramatic. Right. So specifically, I'm, I am asking about like the, that 2012 to 2017 period. Does that gap widen over time or does that or does that happen kind of right away coming out of the recession? Uh, so it, it does take a couple years. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if we look at, at some of the figures, you'll see that actually by 2013 and 14, we're we're approaching 2004 levels, 2005 levels. But it does take a it does take three to four years to get to that point. So we do begin to see like a slight, you know, a, a, almost like a linear increase in, in in the odds of getting a high cost loan. Got it. And and it, I would say that that increase is only magnified or is very dependent on the type of neighborhood that that people are applying to. So we see that that increase is more dramatic in predominantly. Uh, non-white neighborhoods. Yeah, so that's what I want. That's another thing I wanted to, to follow up on. Of course, is like the, the neighborhood story because some people, well, there's a couple things going on with why there might be racial disparities here, and the you know Achilles' heel of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act or HUMDA data is that you don't have credit scores, right? You don't you don't know exactly like everything about the borrowers. And so you can't exact, you can't make perfect apples, apples comparisons. So some might say, oh, well, you know, lenders are making judgments based on credit worthiness. And then another person might also say, and because of racial segregation in this country, there might be riskier investments in predominantly minority neighborhoods. And again, lenders are making good judgments based on like not really wanting to uh, lend in those, in those areas. And of course we've made, a, we've got legislation to, to that has dealt with that over the years, but like, how do you think about kind of those two issues with, you know, the lender perspective? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think there's two, two ways that I'll attack the neighborhood one first, because I think it's a little easier, which is in the mod or in the paper, we also want to control for these economic factors in the neighborhood. So in addition to the borrower characteristics like loan income and, and loan amounts, we also took a look at like local labor markets. So unemployment in the area, we looked at the income in the actual neighborhood or census tract of which they were trying to buy the home. In addition to just examining the ethno-racial makeup of that neighborhood. And so that's kind of how we, we tried to, to look at some of that. Uh, we also l- took into account, so 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 Massey and Rue have created, uh, have access to credit scores in an area. And so it's like more of a contextual f- variable. It's not really going to do much. Uh, I mean, just because the country is so large and, and, and you're just getting an average effect. However, I would say that when it comes to the lack of credit score, I agree. The data set doesn't have credit score. However, one of the interesting parts about this paper is that we disentangle the outcome. And one of the outcomes is a denial due to bad credit. And that's especially important because theoretically, I can now, with that variable, I can quote unquote say, well, I'm controlling for credit. These are all people that have technically have bad credit. So everyone in this sample, or at least in this outcome, has had, like, the bank has provided a reason for a higher, that this individual has higher risk. And so by doing that or having that category on its own, we should see essentially noise in a lot of ways, right? We shouldn't see any variation. We shouldn't see the same type of pattern that we would see in high cost loans or denials due to other reasons. But in fact, it's the same pattern, right? So even if we think about like, well, what about the credit? Maybe the credit would mitigate this entire pattern. Well, this one outcome 
which the banks themselves have to provide a reason for when an individual denied, gets denied, these are all people that, quote unquote, are higher risk or economically higher risk. And yet that same pattern that we see with Black and Latino borrowers is maintained. Right. And so I think when I was presenting this paper at conferences, that was a big one. I, I remember a couple of bankers and an economist came up and I was like, <laughs> That's why your paper makes sense. <laughs> Not for this other stuff, but because I was able to technically control to a certain extent some of these, some of the applicants by saying, well, actually all of them are have bad credit. So mm-hmm. there shouldn't be any ethno-racial, the disparities should almost, there should be noise, right? We shouldn't see a pattern. And yet that pattern is still maintained. And so I think that was what, you know, pushed this paper along. And that's that's a good lead into. So one reason for rejection was bad credit. That's very explicit. The other reason is just other reasons. Yeah. And so it can it can mean a lot of different things. And and those other reasons, rejections, were much higher for Black and Latino applicants than for white or Asian applicants. You could say, you know, the other reason is just outright discrimination. Um, but it's hard to know given the catch-all nature of that term. So are lenders required to provide any other information beyond checking this other re- other reasons box? Or like, how do you interpret that outcome for people that's, and the, and particularly the disparity um, in that outcome? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. So as part of HUMDA, um, in addition to just the application outcome, if an individual is denied, each, each institution has to provide a reason for that denial. And there are nine different reasons, eight of which I call bad credit. So for instance, an individual can be denied because their employment history, they have an incomplete employment history. Uh, their their mm-hmm. uh, debt to income ratio is really high. They don't have enough of a down payment or collateral. Their credit score is, is poor. They don't have enough, their income doesn't meet the threshold. There's various economic reasons, right? So that's why I call it bad credit. However, there is this one reason. So the banks or the financial institutions do have to provide a reason to the borrower as to why they were denied. And this one reason that it has nothing to do with, I would like to argue, is not economically driven, is you could be denied simply for other reasons. It's unclear what those other reasons are. But- right we know that it's probably not related to economic reasons because had it been an economic reason, they would have checked off one of the other eight boxes. Yeah, they have plenty of other exactly. choices for that. And so right. for the most part, that's, that's why we separated that one out because it was enough, it would, there was enough individuals or, or the proportion of people that were being rejected were enough to actually consider it its own category. So it wasn't just like a random less than half a percentage point or a few thousand people when we're talking about millions of observations. This was a a significant uh, component for a lot of Black and Latino borrowers. So they were simply being denied due to other reasons. And in fact, Mm -hmm. uh, I actually saw a letter once that was like, you've been denied. And the reason is uh, unspecified. (laughs) And (laughs) and so uh, they do have to provide this reason, but it's unclear what that reason actually is. That's why we put it in quotes. It's literally yeah. when they have to submit this to the federal government, it's other. Yeah, that's frustrating because what do you what do you do with that? And how else do you interpret it, especially given those disparities? Yeah, well, the interesting part. So that was, you know, that the paper only goes up, up until 2017. Um, the last 18 and 19 have actually recently been published. And mm-hmm. there were some cool additions to that. So going back to Mike's point earlier, they added debt to income ratios property values, uh, they added some additional economic like variables. And mm-hmm. guess what we see now? We see a dramatic decrease in the number of denials due to other reasons. I mean, I haven't run a model. I don't know why. I just find it to be an interesting coincidence that when we that when uh, they're now requested to provide additional variables, that this this mm-hmm. denial for other reasons has has is literally now less than 1%. And so this is what more like in line with what I thought I would get. But in previous years, we saw this like larger, uh, there was a larger proportion that were being denied due to other reasons. I can't tell you why I don't work for the bank. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm hearing, you feel like there's some nefariousness here, but it, it does kind of sound like maybe the lenders were like, hey, you have these eight options that are all economic. And then we just are left with this other reasons. We've got these other things that we think would also make good ones to check off. 
So were those reasons for denial or those are just data points that are separate just to be? Yeah, those are actually just separate data points, not even reasons for denial. And actually the data points are just actually, some of them are just were some of the reasons that people were denied before, right? So like high debt to income ratio, you could have been denied. Mm -hmm. You still can be denied due to high debt to income ratio. But now I also have what that percentage is. So now I know it's like 50%. So maybe that one financial institution views 50% as too high or something like that. So now we can actually compare some of this variation that we couldn't see Mm -hmm. before. We just have to say, oh, it was high debt to income ratio. We don't actually know what that means. Now we can do a little more like in-depth analysis. But I did find it interesting that the moment we, that Humda requires a little more information, this one category, all of a sudden, it's it's kind of like no longer as applicable. uh, for for Yeah, sounds like a good story. That's that's progress. I think my my next one is a it's a big encompassing question and it is what is causing this <laughs> um and maybe you know based on your answer what do you think we could actually do to fix some of these things um I have I have a few notes down here of like possible things I put down you know is it an issue of lending based on neighborhoods rather than people is this something with like financial fintech, you know, big data, where you have inputs that are perpetuating past discriminatory treatment? Is it just plain old racial or ethnic discrimination? What's going on? And then what do we do about it? Yeah. um, So I would be remiss, like, it's very difficult to prove discrimination in any dimension, especially in housing, right? So I I don't have the luxury Mm -hmm. of being able to do audit studies in this case. And it's very difficult to do an audit study with the financial institution to see whether or not someone would qualify or, or not qualified. Maybe maybe you can tell a little bit about what previous audit studies have found just for some context so people kind of understand what the typical finding is for those and what they are. So, I, so HUD actually has invested in a couple audit studies over time. Um, their first one that they did was in the late 80s where they kind of tracked Black and Latino borrowers, bl- white Black and Latino borrowers through the home buying process, um, essentially gave them very similar characteristics and did these quasi and and did these experiments um, mm-hmm. in in different cities um, across the country. And what they found was that discrimination, and they did this in the late '80s, early 2000s, and I think they tried to do one in the late like 2009, 2010. But for the most part, like the big ones were. They, they, they found that discrimination overall in housing has gone down. However, mm-hmm. it still exists. <laughs> and so what they found is, you know, I think a lot of people were cheering because they're like, wow, look, it, it's gone down dramatically. And it's like, yes, but it's still really high and it's still a, a major barrier for minority bar or for minority homeowners. And that's and that's not just, you know, discrimination with lending. It's also realtors not showing black families homes in certain neighborhoods and, and many other correct things, so right? that's steering that's the quality of the service that they receive that's also the type of loan mm-hmm. products that they were offered also the fees right. that they that people that individuals have to pay when they when they when they're looking to buy a home and so across the board black and latino borrowers or latino homeowners were just they had higher prices and more barriers uh, to overcome mm-hmm. to get to home ownership and so while it's declined, it's still massively prevalent in the housing market. And that's what HUD's point of the study was. Now, in terms of like how the mortgage industry has evolved over time, which goes to your second point or your second thought, which is a lot of this is being driven by like big data. So when we talk mm-hmm. to our parents or when I talk to my mom or my grandmother, a lot of them had relationships at the bank when they were growing up. So when they got a home loan, they went to their local bank and they asked for a loan. And they assumed that they were getting the lo- the best loan product that the bank could offer, that there wasn't going to be a lot of shopping around because you had that one-on-one relationship. That's changed a lot, right? So now we can get a proof for a loan, you know, with our computers. Uh, I don't technically have to see a mortgage expert or meet with a banker until closing potentially, right? A lot of it is mm-hmm. actually done over the phone. And so if a lot of the major financial institutions, if you were even interested in buying a home, they're just going to put you on a phone at the bank because they don't have a mortgage broker there. And so how banks now do it is, is primarily through big data, right? So we have these. And so when you ask me, like, what do I believe the mechanisms are? This paper doesn't prove or can't, doesn't really show what the, me- the, the true mechanisms are as much as it's just documenting the demographic changes and, and transitions of inequality. But I would argue, like, 
if I was to read beyond my paper and, and just in the literature in general, that at least in the mortgage market, we are replicating the type of society through our big data analysis that financial institutions are using. And so that's, yeah. you know, big data only is, is only as good as the data that you have. And if the data that we have is all messed up, you buy it <laughs> and unequal to black and brown communities and borrowers, then that's what we're going to replicate. Yeah. And so I think that's what we see right now, that that's what we're seeing, especially as neighborhoods transition. Yeah. And so that's kind of like, it kind of sucks to say, like, do I know what the mechanisms? I, I wish I knew. Um, I, I have an idea. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the like big data algorithm front, you know, I'm far from an expert on this at all, but it sounds to me like the evidence is, is pretty strong that the algorithm is not a sentient being and, and can't see race, but the algorithm is is racist. Right. <laughs> that's, that's bad news. Um, you know, shout out to Sophia Noble at, at UCLA for her book, Algorithms of Oppression, which I haven't read, but I know it tells us the algorithm's racist. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, it's it's difficult, right? Like, even when we read, so I am interested in like big data. And when I read the computer science papers that talk about it, you almost see them like it's, it's, it's like the wild, wild west in a lot of ways. They're, 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 they're pushing the limits to what computer analysis and document, like what it actually means, right? And so it, it's interesting to see that the type of data that they're using is the data that we as social scientists use. And so if we see that this inequality is, is, is occurring, in a lot of ways, the computer doesn't know. And the computer has no, like, it doesn't know what, it doesn't know theory. It doesn't know how our society is. We're just feeding it the data that we believe is essentially reflects the society that we're in. And so if our, our, if our society is highly unequal, then you're going to get these unequal results. Right. Like you said, I don't need to know the race yeah. of a borrower if I know the type of neighborhood right. or that you're trying to buy a home in. And that'll give me an idea as to price appreciation over time and, and, and turnover in the neighborhood and the average housing stock and whether or not there's new permits coming in. Like that, that information is pretty readily available just with knowing the census tract. And that's pretty right. scary, but but I also think that should be the point of emphasis for public like for public policy. It's like, well, we do know we know where segregated neighborhoods are. We know where the, where there's a void in lending, and and how do we kind of reverse some of those patterns? Yeah, and I know that this is sort of we're getting beyond the scope of your paper itself, but you know we want to talk about the solutions as well. We know that there has been progress made, as you said, discrimination is not as bad in in the housing market as it used to be prior to the Fair Housing Act, and presumably it's improved fairly incrementally. But, you know, what else can we do? Because it's clear that the Fair Housing Act, the anti-discrimination provisions, the audit studies are not doing enough. They're very reactive, I guess. So, like, ha have you read anything about what we can do to be a little more proactive about this? Um, I think... As a researcher and, and as a scholar, there's always, well, I, I need more data, right? So that's the first point. <laughs> I think everyone we've yeah, talked to has said that so know, far. And I totally shocker, understand. right? <laughs> but I, I do think that like our communities, if we're talking like, it, it depends on the type of problem that we're trying to solve, right? And so if the, is it housing? Or are we talking like, when we talk about housing, is it because we're talking about wealth inequality in the US? Is it because we're talking about quality of life in the, you know, like what type of inequality are we trying to address? And I think that'll kind of guide the type right. of solution that we're looking for. Uh, in fact, I see myself more like day after day, and maybe this is because of the, I'm, I'm just in front of my computer all day at home. It's like, I always ask myself, like, what about the other side? Like the rental side, what does that transition look like? And how I find myself over and over, like describing all the incentives to home ownership. And yet mm -hmm. I, I I almost am like lost. To, but what's the incentives for renting? And why isn't that something of emphasis when we think about public policy in terms of providing quality housing for, for families or opportunities? Right. And so if we're talking about like the type of right. neighborhoods people live in, uh, like one of the, I mean, go, I mean, we'll go back to like Lincoln Heights has these beautiful, beautiful, like craftsman style homes. Right. Is it necessary that someone has to own it or is it, just as important to have people rent it, but have like the parks and and have access to to good quality schools. Like, what's what is really the value of home ownership rather than just? So I find myself thinking more about that 
at home, and maybe that's 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 a bad thing. I I, I can say I'm I am right there with you more than you know. I, I have a three thousand word rental pension idea, basically. <laughs> That I that I've been writing in the evenings on the weekends that uh, I'm gonna probably run by all of you guys pretty soon. I, I don't think it's a Lewis <laughs> Center thing really. It's a little too <laughs> off the wall, but uh, I, I've been thinking about exactly. But the I same do think questions. that like the important part is like the incentive part, and I think since you know since yeah. uh, really since the creation of FHA in the 1920s, its home ownership has been highly subsidized, highly incentivized, and and I think to a certain extent, even me as a scholar, I lose focus as to like. Well, what's the other side? Can we create incentives for renting? Is there an opportunity for renters to also increase, you know, social mobility yeah. or, or 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 decrease the the, the wealth gap uh, that we currently see? So it, I, I'm concerned with the wealth gap, and so that's where I would probably focus my attention. Yeah, uh, when it comes. To- I mean, to you know, since you know, it, it's hard for me to shut up right now because I'm somebody who studies the rental side. Um, far more than I study the home ownership side, right? And and to me, like what what makes one thing that makes your your paper so important and and interesting is like I bristle at this idea that home ownership has to be widespread in order to create wealth, right? Because I don't think home I don't think a home should be such uh, a source of wealth for for people or, or should take up so much of their total wealth pie, right? Like, I think a lot of bad things come from that. And, you know, we'll talk about some of those things on like seven other podcasts. But, but like, you know, to me, what's what really like makes me, you know, gnash my teeth when I read this paper is I think about why we think of home ownership as such a wealth builder is because it used to be an incredible wealth builder in the United States, largely for white people, because we, essentially banned um, non-white people um, and mostly black people in, in, in cities uh, across the country from owning homes just when it was a perfect time to buy a cheap house that was <laughs> 20 right. years later going to be five times as expensive. Right. And, and so that, but I think that, that you're studying a, a different, but similar time period, right. Where like coming out of the great recession, there were a lot of great deals you know, we we saw this housing market collapse in so many places, and I was one person in 2012 who bought a house, and this house is now a lot more expensive than it was then, and I got lucky. Um, but like, if the if the mortgage market was like, oh, let's get back to our discriminating ways, that's really really bad, <laughs> you know, because this is a this is again a pretty good t- this was a good time period over the last eight years or so. To build that wealth. And that just fe- feels really, that makes me mad, very mad. And I think we're, I think we're kind of, our minds are warped a little yeah. bit living in California, where we, we kind of assume it's just like normal that all property appreciates in value at this rapid pace. But like, you know, if you bought a home in Cleveland 30 or 40 years ago, like yeah. you're, you're yeah. worse off than if you had not bought at all. And so, yeah, I, I 100% agree with all that. Yeah. I know we got to wrap up here pretty quick, but um, I try to ask this of, of all the researchers we bring on. With this paper, were there any questions that you weren't able to resolve, something that you're kind of looking to address in the future without giving too much away and allowing people no, to scoop good. you? Well, I mean, they could try. <laughs> so I would, I, would li- I would actually like it. Um, I, I'm interested to see. So one of the things that we did was just the neighborhood, racial composition, and the composition of the borrower. But I'm actually also really interested, kind of like what Mike's point and what we kind of brought up in the last few minutes, which is what happened, like, what's the impact of the credit market on low-income Blacks and Latinos versus high-income Blacks and Latinos through these different stages? And did access look differently for all of them uh, when we think about whites, Blacks, Latinos, and Asians? And so I think the next, yeah, essentially that's the paper, right? <laughs> and so the next <laughs> one is to look at well, what, what does that look like for in terms of different socioeconomic classes in terms of their access to mortgage credit? And does that tell us more? Maybe this idea of wealth like that we sell people or this idea of home ownership that we sell low-income individuals or low-income families, maybe it's a farce. Maybe there's not there are, maybe there are no low-income families that are actually trying to purchase a home. And so we're selling this idea that they, they that they have limited access to. And so that's that's the that's yeah. that's yeah. my next interest. 
I remember pulling up some data years ago, just looking at different cities, their their median value and how much it had grown over a you know 20 or 30 year period. And the places that were most expensive in 1980 or 1990, they actually grew in percentage terms at a, at a higher rate than in value than the home values in these cheaper areas. So, so if you could afford a home in Los Angeles or New York or Seattle in 1990, then it was a great investment. If you couldn't afford a home there and you bought, you know, in the Rust Belt or somewhere in the Sun Belt or something, uh, the appreciation just wasn't as, as great. And so, you know, the people who could afford the most got the best returns and the people who couldn't either appreciated very slowly or maybe even lost value. And so it's, you know, this rich get richer yeah. kind of situation. So, yeah, that's exactly. I kind of want to see and I want to see maybe there's a, there's differences amongst different ethno-racial groups. And especially because they're also regionally, spatially, we're pretty, we're different ethno-racial groups are just spatially concentrated in specific areas of the country. So I want to examine that kind of like what that social structure looks like to a certain extent. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're all all done here. So thank you so much for joining us, Jose. Thank you. Thanks, great. Jose. Thanks, Mike and Shane. Have a great day. That is a wrap on today's episode of the UCLA Housing Voice podcast. We have links to Jose's work and the other articles mentioned during our conversation in the show notes, including my zany rental pension idea, which was recently published in The Atlantic. You can keep up with us on Facebook and Twitter at UCLA Lewis Center, and you can follow me at Shane D. Phillips and Dr. Lenz at MC underscore Lenz. Help other people find the podcast by rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you like, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks.